There's 1.5 million bikes stolen every single year. That means there's three bikes stolen every single minute. That's 20 bikes stolen just in this presentation that I'm going to give you guys. With the average total value of about $20,000. That's $350 million per year. And get this, that's the United States alone. So the next question you should be asking yourself is why? Everybody has bike blocks. They're spending 20 bucks to 200 bucks if you, want, if you bought one off of Indiegogo. And hopefully I can share some uh, light on that. First of all, there's been major innovation in power tools. So as bike blocks get better, smarter, stronger, fatter, the power tools that cut them got better at an accelerated rate. The video I'm going to show you may shock some people. If you want to leave the room, this is a good time to do it. This is Valencia Street, San Francisco, broad daylight, 3 p.m. That's a child in, in a stroller. And this guy is grinding through this thing, and, and it takes 27 seconds to cut through. Shocking. <laughs> Number two, bike theft is a risk-free crime. It's a slap on the wrist. It's a fine. Most people that steal bikes get no punishment. As it turns out, it costs more to throw them in jail. Uh, than people can actually get from it. So somebody actually, specifically from City Lab, did a study on crimes for bike theft. As it turns out, economically speaking, it pays to steal bikes, <laughs> especially in the United States. Third, companies are lying to you. They're providing a false sense of security. You bought this lock, you don't get insurance. Worst case scenario, you have theft protection because that's what they sold you. Well, guess what? This is coming straight from the fine print from our major competitor that sold a $150 lock. Notice here, the limitations of this anti-theft program is if it was cut with power tools, a battery, operated tool, a torch, anything, it's void. Well, guess what? That's the only thing thieves use to cut these things. <laughs> And this is from personal experience, this is our frustration. So here's our solution. And there's no better way of showing this than a quick video. So. chemicals inside to deter theft. So now I'm going to go into a little bit of the product development and the first steps that we had. I'm not going to hit all these subjects, but I'm going to start with the most important one, which is, is this even legal? You're probably asking yourself. Well, the first thing we did is we hired a bunch of lawyers and we found out. As it turns out, the first consideration you have to have is, does this fall under booby trap laws? And as it turns out, at least in the United States, you have to give a fair warning. So you, you guys probably heard the guy that got shot with a booby trap shotgun in someone's house, and you're like, no, this can't be legal. Well, nobody let that guy know that shotgun was in that house. We have warnings all over this thing. So, check. The second thing is, what is exactly this formula. How dangerous is it? Obviously, to thieves and to the general public, we're trying to market this as dangerous as possible. Because we want the number one uh, form of uh, deterrent 
is that they don't cut this at all. So the next video is probably even more shocking than the one I just showed you, but our formula is completely food grade. In fact, it was inspired by food, a Swedish fermented fish, canned fermented fish. <laughs> and the video I'm about to show you is a video of somebody dumb enough to buy this can of fermented fish and crack it open with their entire family outside. So obviously, with that inspiration, we went into formula development. Here we are extracting a few of the chemicals from the map. Of course, we didn't go with 1% concentration. We went with 99% concentration. <laughs> and this is actually on uh, Innovation Nation. So if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more how we built this, uh, you can look us up online. That's the link. Number three, we have to find a disc tumbler. A lock is only as good as the actual locking mechanism. If you can just pick the lock with a big pen, which was the case with uh, one of our competitors, nobody's going to cut it in the first place. So we have to source the best disc tumbler lock mechanism out there uh, as a standard. Then we have to actually develop the shaft. This is the part that is the majority of our innovation. Nobody's done this before. As it turns out, it's a lot harder to pressurize something inside uh, a shackle like this than you might imagine. Then obviously, mass production. Uh, what made sense to us was rapid prototyping in, in the US with my business partner. He's a Swiss-born engineer. And assembly in the US. Component manufacturing and disc tumbler sourcing in China. Maybe Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's our go-to-market? And that's essentially what we're selling, where to sell it, and how to sell it. First, we have to define our customer. Who are the people that are actually buying this thing? As it turns out, it's commuters, it's daily cyclists, people that depend on their bike to get to work, get somewhere. And usually they're expensive bikes. Secondly, they've experienced theft before. If you've ever had a bike stolen, the first thing you do is you go online and research why your $150 lock didn't work, you know, and they're providing all these promises. Thirdly, for a premium product, usually the people interested in it have more expensive bikes. They're the ones that need it most. If you have a $100 bike, you're pretty, you're pretty safe usually. Uh, I can't guarantee you're gonna survive coming down Taylor Street. You know, with thousands of disc brakes on that $100 bike, but it might not get stolen. And the way we decide to reach these customers is through digital marketing online. Secondly, we have to define our market. And the way we did that is we decided we needed to be competitive in two areas. We needed to be extremely effective as a theft deterrent, and we needed to be very practical. Because you have chain locks, which uh, any cyclist in here is aware of, uh, but you know they're really heavy. Unless you have an electric bike, they're not practical. But they are effective. Uh, then you have U-locks, the majority of our direct competitors. The way we positioned ourselves was right above the U-lock. We are just as practical in size. We're about the same size as the kryptonite, forget about it, lock. But we consider ourselves as good or better than a chain lock at deterrent theft. Thirdly, we have to define our distribution. And the way we did that, and this is still sort of coming together, this is the stage we're at now, is 75% uh, is going through direct, mostly online sales. 25% is small specialty bike shops. Managers that are passionate about our product, that are willing to explain to cyclists why the block that they just spent $150 on can get cut by an angle grinder in, in 15 seconds. And eventually we're gonna partner with uh, Amazon. Fundraising. So most people that have ran a campaign will tell you, you need some capital before even going on a crowdfunding campaign if you really want to succeed. So we had a great set of committed angel investors and strategic partners that got us the initial capital to create our campaign. After that, we went on Indiegogo and got the remainder that we needed to actually move into manufacturing. Pricing. We priced ourselves competitive to existing Premium U-locks, the way I define premium U-locks is anything that's bolt cutter resistant. So it's hardened to about 400 brittle 
poor and simple terms, you can't cut it with a big pair of scissors. You have to take out a power tool. So out of that market, we have the Kryptonite, forget about it, about 110 bucks. We have the Abus Granite, about 122 bucks. Coming from Germany, a little bit of a premium. Takes 16 seconds to cut. <laughs> Stunt Block, $119 on Indiegogo as of today. Uh, Pre-order. Our team, pretty vast, vast team right now. It's my business partner, Eve, head of engineering and I, and a bunch of help from very gracious people willing to answer questions and contractors. Thanks for uh, listening. Uh, tech question for you. Uh, you mentioned the, the shackle is pressurized. Um, so the shackle itself is hollow. Yeah. Um, how, um, how do you maintain pressure over time? So this is uh, medium carbon hardened steel. So this, this stuff is harder than what's housing your lithium ion battery in your phone. Uh, to put things into perspective, if you took a screwdriver and, and slammed it into your iPhone, it would probably explode. If you tried to do that to this lock, it would never happen. The only way you can puncture this is taking an angle grinder with a silicone carbide wheel and cutting through it. At 30% it will puncture the seal, releasing the chemicals. Uh, so it may, it, it may deteriorate over the next 30 years. It's very unlikely that will ever come.